we talk about John the baptizer a fair amount in, in Advent, in part, or perhaps in large part, because his job, his role, is to get people ready for Jesus coming into their lives, coming into, the, into their world, being where they live, and speaking and preaching and teaching. So John is trying to get all those people ready so they're able to hear, so they're able to respond. And his words echo down through time to us. Or he's trying to do the same thing for us, to get us ready for Jesus coming into the world, coming into our lives again this year. Because this is the time of year that we prepare for the celebration of Jesus' birth and for the idea that God, that Jesus will be reborn in us again. It's interesting, isn't it? That people who seek to speak and do God's work, their words and their work echoes down through time. Let us listen for the word of God as it's found in the gospel according to Mark, reading from the first chapter. Verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. May God bless this reading from Holy Scripture. John is... Well, John is a unique character. He is, uh, what we know of him from the gospel accounts is that he resides out in the wilderness, which is a place away from the urban areas and even the rural towns. It's a place in which it's dangerous. There's as many animals, if not more animals, than there are people. It's hard to find things to eat. But John chooses this place to live. And this is where he works. He preaches, he speaks, and people eventually hear what he has to say, and they come out to him. And so as this, as word of what John, where John lives, and how he dresses and what he eats, and what he's saying reaches the people in the surrounding countrysides and even the urban areas like Jerusalem. They come out to him to hear what he has to say. And it reminds the people, for their very, their very understanding and school, it reminds them of what the prophet Isaiah spoke, of the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make ready for the way of God. So John is telling people, it's time to get ready. It is time to prepare yourself. Now, John, not only because of where he lives and how he dresses, his voice seems like a strange voice to these folks. And one of the additional reasons is that he does not choose to speak highly of himself, but 
he speaks highly of the one who will come after him. Now, how often do we hear famous public figures, people that are before us, that, you know, we go, oh, did you hear about so-and-so? Did you hear? I mean, usually they're kind of pointing their fingers at themselves, or they're performing, or they're doing something, so we'll take notice of them. But what John says is, the one who comes after me is far greater than me. I, I'm not even worth, worthy to bend down in the dirt and untie his filthy sandal. And I, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. These words sound strange to those people who are coming to hear what he has to say. You know, here's John. He's famous, yet he's saying of someone who's coming after after him, that's even more famous, more important. And also his words sound strange because he's telling the folks that what they need to do is repent. And that really means, that means they need to turn back to God. They need to reconnect with God, recommit to God. And that's a different message than people have been hearing. And it's a different message than we often here. The people of John's time were told that they had to follow all the rules and, you know, and if they weren't sure what the rules were, they should speak to the religious authorities and they would tell them what the rules are. But that was really what was most important. If you follow the rules, you were going to be okay. But John was saying, that's not really it. What's important is whether you are paying attention to God, whether you are speaking praying to God, and whether you're listening to what God's saying to you. That's what we're called to do. That's what you have to do. And if we do that, if we engage in that sort of work, then we're going to be ready for when God comes into our life. And John is saying, you better get ready, because I know God's coming. We need to hear that message as much today as those folks did. Because the voices that we hear that call us to recommit and reconnect to God, well, they sound like they're voices out in the wilderness. They sound like that's very strange. I mean, we have our ideas of what it is that we should be doing and how it is that we should be doing it. But the idea that Really, what's important for us to do is to pray and to listen first so we can get ready. Now, that sounds kind of bizarre. But that's what John reminds us. And he does more than try to just remind people. You know, our, from what we can discern from the Gospels, John was fairly vocal and loud in what he said and how he said it. Enough so that even the king was bothered, and the queen. But these words still mean the same for us. That calling to reconnect, to recommit. And it is interesting as well that John the baptizer is the person we speak about on this day when we also light a candle for peace. Because at first, it seems they're kind of at opposite ends. We don't think of John, and then the word peace or peaceful comes to mind. More we think of loud and kind of raucous and all that kind of stuff. But what John is offering to us is a way to really find peace. Because what John is saying is, it's important to repent, reconnect with God, recommit to God. And when we do that, when we make that reconnection, that recommitment, that's when we begin to sense the peace of God to a greater and greater extent. When we're running around and we're harried and we're ignoring the voices in the wilderness, all that kind of stuff, we can try really hard to, oh, I just got to relax, I gotta, oh, no, no, but still we're tense, we're anxious. It is in reconnecting recommitting that we begin to sense to a greater and greater extent the peace of God, the peace that God is offering to each and every one of us. And as wonderful as that is, 
and it is. God's peace isn't, doesn't just sit with us. We don't just sort of dwell in that and are grateful and think, ah, oh, the world is now a much better place. Because while we might feel more at peace, we also recognize that the world around us is not at peace. And when we reconnect and we recommit with God, God stirs within us that desire to make or help make the world more peaceful. That we lend our hands to that task and that work. And we can better lend our hands to that task and that work if we ourselves have found a place of peace, if we have been able to find God's peace, which, which gives us that strength and the courage and the clear-sightedness as to what it is that we can do to bring peace to a greater and greater extent in the world around us. For we don't even have to try hard to know that our families, our local community, our state, our country, our world desperately needs peace. So that loud person out in the wilderness, that voice crying out from seemingly the middle of nowhere, is calling us to get ready for God coming into our lives. And the way that we best do that is to recommit to God, to reconnect to God, to repent. And when we do that, we find remarkably God's peace, which enables us to do the hard work, the work that tears down mountains and brings up valleys, so that peace can be achieved in the whole of creation for all people.